Good morning, good afternoon, Americas. Good evening, Europe, Africa and Asia, and possibly even good night. My name is Rob Erselman, and I'm your moderator for today. I come with 25 years in well engineering and technology development in oil and gas, geothermal and renewables R&D. These three overlap in the quest to drill ultra hard, ultra hot rock for geothermal exploration, exploitation. Today, I'm chairing of the pleasure of chairing a panel consisting of Mark Russell, CEO of Hypersciences, Igor Kosic, CEO of GA Drilling, Paul Deutsch, CEO of Foro Energy, Janjette Blanchet, founder and CTO of the brand new startup Canopus Drilling Solutions, William Bill Mooney, chief scientist and old veteran at display, Tetra Corporation, and Raphael Souchal, who's joining us from France, director of Drill Star Energies. As we have already heard in earlier panels, heat is king in geothermal. The higher the temperature, the more efficient the whole heat process becomes. So we aim to drill to deeper, typically harder rock in, by definition, a hotter environment. The ultimate objective is to reach ultra high temperatures by drilling in deep formation. Wells in the order of 10 kilometers, 30,000 feet and 300 degrees Celsius, 6,000 Fahrenheit and beyond. But we won't get there all at once. As we already heard on Monday and yesterday, there is a commercial staircase via low and medium heat and thus depth. Technically, both oil and gas and geothermal have already been a long way there, but these wells were expensive, often very expensive. To make it economical for geothermal, the wells must become a lot cheaper. This session is the first of two on how we might get there. Tomorrow, in the future of the well session, we will hear how existing and incremental oil and gas expertise, tools and methodologies can be immediately leveraged and improved to enable a variety of geothermal concepts. So please hold your questions relating to casing and completion design, HPHT cementing, rig automation, process optimization, learning curves, etc. until tomorrow. Today, in this future of drilling pan panel, we will focus on the sharp end of the stick, making hole. As we get deeper and hotter, apart from the temperature challenge, rocks under those conditions become ultra hard. For nearly 100 years, drilling has been mostly done rotary mechanical, and this is still evolving at a steady, strong pace. What most oil and gas drillers out there might not know, however, is that PDC bits, now responsible for over 95% of the global footage drilled, are a direct result of er earlier geothermal R&D funding. Likewise, the origin of novel hard rock rotary bits, such as Baker's Chimera and Slumberger's Stinger bit, originate in the geothermal scene and funded R&D. Now, 50 years ago, the crew of the Starship Enterprise introduced many of us to altogether new technologies. There was the currently still science fiction teleportation, but there was also wireless handheld communication, user-friendly computers, voice recognition, non-invasive imaging, ion propulsion, force fields and phaser weapons. Some were based on already existing fundamental R&D. Others, however, were completely fake, but drove new inventions now deeply integrated into our daily lives. Mobile phones, personal computers and medical imaging are all attributed to Star Trek by their inventors. TRIS, the theory of inventive problem solving by its Russian acronym, analyzed many thousands of patents and derived trends of evolutions in systems development. One of these tells us that systems will increase segmentation and use of fields. We went from a knight in shining but heavy and inflexible armor to chainmail body armor. And right now we're looking at dynamic or electric armor that's proposed for the protection of ships and vehicles from shape shaped charged weapons. It's the same with drilling. We started digging by hand, then hand tools, then percussion hammers drilling, then rotary by and tricones and now PVC bits. Directionally, we went from uncontrolled to whip stocks to bent motors and now continuous rotary steerables. In well control, we went from uncontrolled to complete portfolio of managed pressure drilling methods. And in casing design, we went from highly tapered to monobore. With my background, I have to mention these. We went from digging a water hole where we lived with hand tools to drilling ultra deep HPHT wells far offshore in hostile weather and ultra deep water. 
we are pushing wells out further and more complex than ever before. We can do that again with drilling for depth and temperature. This is nothing we haven't done before. The existing drilling methods are most certainly still improving, but it's evolutionary, not revolutionary. It's time for a new S-curve in making whole. So it's my pleasure today to have the six people that I introduced to you early. And I would give each of them three minutes to explain their interest in geothermal and also their background and the fundamental principles of technology. So I'd like to start with Mark Russells from Hyperscience. Over to you, Mark. OK, hi. Thanks very much, Rob. Uh, thanks, Jamie, for putting this together. Um, with this projectile and this projectile and uh, millions more like these projectiles, Hyperscience is, is revolutionizing uh, deep, low-cost drilling for geothermal as well as applications in the tunneling business. Uh, I'm Mark Russell. I'm the CEO and founder of Hypersciences. My background is aeroastro engineering, as well as my family's in the mining business. Uh, I was lead engineer for Jeff Bezos, uh, Blue Origin, Amazon, uh, leading crew capsule development. And I left to create a company that revolutionizes the use of hypersonics to fly projectiles into rock at hypersonic speeds, which radically changes how one can drill a hole. Uh, what we have been doing with Shell and another major uh, world-class mining company is developing a drill that allows us to drill at cost points that are an order of magnitude lower and potentially 10x faster than today's current drilling technology. The way our technology works is as a rotary bit is turning, we call augmented hyperdrill, we fire projectiles through the middle of the drill bit where they break 70% or more of the rock and pulverizing it into small materials that are brought up in drill cuttings. We use conventional drilling rigs and technology, but we go substantially faster change the game for the low cost access to geothermal heat that we're looking for. That's what I founded the company on. And we look forward to demonstrating this in our field trials that are ongoing now in the mining business that are applicable to both the energy sector as well as the mineral sector. And beyond that, we'll run the same similar tests in the tunneling space, uh, participating even in Elon Musk's tunneling challenge that's coming up. So hyperscience is revolutionizing the speed at which we uh, can drill by pulverization with hypersonic impact with millions of projectiles. OK, thank you, Mark. Igor, over to you. Hi, my name is Igor Kosis, uh, company Geothermal Anywhere, GA Drilling. Uh, my background is uh, electrical engineering and uh, uh, all my co-founders have the strong scientific and technology background. Uh, I started my career in the area of uh, electrical engineering, IT, even artificial intelligence in the harsh environments. And then uh, 15 years ago, I was fascinated by the potential of the geothermal energy. And uh, we started to look uh, why it is not possible to make it happen anywhere. And uh, we found that there are, of course, a lot of obstacles, but the biggest one is the drilling. And then we started to uh, work uh, to find a totally new concept that will be able to make it uh, uh, significantly or revolutionarily better. We spent first five years of the company running with the fundamental research, uh, knowing the physics about the uh, potential uh, different thermal and non-thermal technologies. And then uh, in some 2014-15, we started to work closely with the drilling industry, means also oil and gas. Uh, it was a very good lesson learned because we found out that uh, to make some success, we need to have a very good test facility and uh, we created a center of excellence, uh, being able to help us with the high, high, uh, high temperature testing. The result of our work uh, was the technology based on plasma. Uh, Shortly, just to imagine that you have the stream of very hot media that is uh, directly influencing the rock. And the uh, rock, even any other material like a steel, uh, is crumbling into the small pieces. And uh, that was then the work last uh, three, four years 
to combine this uh, very fast technology that can work order of magnitude faster in a hard rocks with the conventional equipment and uh, rigs uh, to be able to deliver the full concept solution. Though. So that's why we also last year we joined the forces with uh, operators, uh, go to the field trial and uh, being able then to prove it in the next uh, months and years in a practice. So that's our history and uh, we are looking forward for a nice discussion today. OK, thank you, Igor. Over to Paul Deutsch, please. Thank you, Rob, and uh, thank you, Jamie, and the rest of the people organizing this event. Uh, we're pleased to participate and share what Foro is doing in this area. Uh, we, our original project when we got started 10 years ago was around using lasers for drilling hard rock for geothermal. So we're excited to be back and talking about this subject now with everybody else. And um, we, uh, our company is focused on commercializing high power laser applications. And for a calibration point, what we define as a high power laser, is something in the order of 20 kilowatts or 60 kilowatts or higher, as opposed to milliwatts, which lasers power levels reservoir monitoring companies. We, uh, we have kind of three types of people in our company, which I think is critical to successful introduction of any novel drilling technology, and that's a combination of people with oil and gas backgrounds, as well as the new technology that you're working on. So for example, I come from an oil field services background, but I've worked alongside people from the hydropower directed energy weapons uh, background last 10 years, and one of our key success factors for realizing this technology is letting the oil field people learn about lasers and letting the lasers learn about the oil field. The idea of using lasers in the oil field and specifically for drilling has been around for several decades. I think it's important to appreciate some of the advancements in the laser technology themselves that make this now plausible. The development of the fiber laser, which is really replaced most conventional cutting and cladding for additive manufacturing parts, is, um, has driven the costs of the lasers down exponentially, as well as the efficiency, the footprint, and the reliability and robustness. And that combination with fiber optic cable technology uh, that's been used for data transmission and reservoir sensing or professional temperature really makes it possible for this to come to the industry today. Oro has introduced some additional innovation that allows you to transmit that power to the pumps. And uh, we have a set of optomechanical components and systems that allows you to transmit that light from the surface to downhole. The laser is on surface. It goes to a fiber optic cable that goes to a connector and then an optics pack cable to be Specifically, the hard rock drilling. When we got started, there was a lot of academic prior to. Paul? Yes. Let me just stop you there on the three minutes. Um, also, can you adjust your headset because your audio is actually pretty bad? Yeah, so I apologize. can hear you a little bit better. Okay, yeah, thank so you. I'll just. We'll I'll come just, back to you. We'll come yeah. back to you later, Paul. We'll go that back for the introduction to the next lot. Uh, Jan Jette, you're the new kid on the block. Uh, so please introduce yourself. Yeah, hi Rob, uh, thanks uh, for the introduction and hi uh, audience as well, wherever you are. Uh, it's uh, really uh, great to be here. Um, yeah, I enjoyed uh, working uh, with uh, Shell for about uh, 20 years and I've been uh, leading a research and development group uh, for drilling automation and extended reach drilling and zonal isolation there. We did many things. We looked at rotary steerables, uh, software rotary systems for the mitigation of uh, stick slip vibrations. Uh, and also, uh, we worked on abrasive uh, jet drilling. Abrasive jet drilling is uh, what I'm focusing on now as well. Um, is uh, uh, based on eroding the rock away with a high velocity particle laden jet in the jet bit. We, we call it a bit, but there is no mechanical interaction there. Abrasive jet drilling is, uh, is great. It has a great rate of penetration. That has been proven already in the field before I was born. Um, and that's quite a while ago, um, but it has always been a blocker, uh, the, the, the thing that you have to circulate a reasonably high uh, particle uh, uh, content through the, uh, through the well. Uh, and that causes ECD problems, circulation density problems, etc. 
We solved that at Shell by developing a downhole recirculation solution. Um, and uh, the result of that is that you only have a high concentration of the particles at the place where you want to have the erosion, that is at the whole bottom, and the rest of the system hardly sees uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the particles uh, themselves, which is great. I left Shell two years ago um, and I founded uh, drilling, uh, Can Canopus uh, Drilling Solution Geothermal last year, so I need uh, a fresh uh, kit on the block. Um, and uh, I can use the, uh, the downhole recirculation solution uh, uh, that was developed at Shell, uh, and I have been adding uh, the directional control to that system. Uh, later on, we'll come back about uh, to, to uh, uh, integrated solutions, I hope, uh, but uh, I think it is essential to have the directional control added to the abrasive jetting technology, including the downhole recirculation. And now we can drill three to six inch long multilaterals, uh, which is a uh, three to six inch diameter and then kilometers long and uh, multilaterals, laterals, which is ideal for the productivity of geothermal reservoirs. There has to be a breakthrough there and there has to be a cost reduction, which has been mentioned several times already of about 60% or 70% on the drilling cost of the subsurface structures. Um, my interest in geothermal is that at this moment, only a fraction of the subsurface is currently suitable for geothermal development. There has to be a major change uh, in this uh, in order to uh, to get close to the targets, the, the geothermal production targets uh, for the Netherlands, Europe, but also I think uh, worldwide. And I think the directional abrasive jet drilling solution can make that at least uh, 10 times more reservoirs become economical. And that's a breakthrough, I would say. Thank you. Okay, thank okay. you very much, uh, Jan Jette. Uh, Bill, you're the veteran of this panel, so please unmute yourself and uh, give us your introduction. Uh, I'm Bill Mooney, Chief Scientist of Tetra Corporation. Uh, we've been in business 43 years and we're specialists in pulse power. We used to do a lot of defense work in pulse power, but then in the late 90s we shifted into drilling and we've been focusing on commercial applications of pulse power into the drilling technology. The particular project that we're involved in right now, we've been at for 18 years, um, and we're involved with a service company and three different operating companies. It's a all electric drilling process, has no moving parts, uses conventional uh, rig, and uh, it's been well demonstrated in the lab. We're now moving into uh, field trials. So we think this has a lot of potential for geothermal because it's very fast in very hard rock. And that's exactly what we need in geothermals to cut the cost of drilling. OK, thank you very much, Bill. And then last but definitely not least, uh, Rafael Suchao. Please unmute yourself, uh, Rafael. Thank you, Rob. Thank you, Jamie. Uh, thanks for inviting me here. So my name is Rafael Suchal, as you mentioned, and uh, I joined Drillstar about 10 years ago, coming from uh, another small tech company called uh, Schlumberger. And uh, what I'm going to talk about uh, tonight is uh, another small tool that, that looks like this, and that's called uh, the mud hammer. So the mud hammer, as you can see or cannot see, is composed of two parts. You have the big tube here. That's called uh, a hammer. It's in fact a high power hammer capable of uh, giving uh, very high powerful blows. And then you, you have the second part, which is here, which is the drill bit. So it looks like a very conventional tool, conventional drill bit, uh, but definitely there's a lot of, uh, of research and science uh, going on there because we've been developing the, the hammer for the last uh, 10 years or so. And a lot of time has been spent on the on the bit itself, because it's not the same thing in drilling with uh, impact with percussion at uh, at surface level or 100 meter deep, and doing the same thing uh, 1,000, 2,000, 5,000 meter deep. So this project originated with uh, oil and gas, and uh, we pivoted about uh, two years ago to geothermal drilling and especially, of course, uh, HDR and uh, EGS. So these are the systems which require a lot of drilling in deep igneous rock, 
where percussion is especially effective and is proven to be a very effective mo mode of uh, drilling those uh, those rocks. And this dates back to two years and years. Um, and um, actually, what we've done during this research is prove first on the bench. So we do have access and that's our chance. And as Igor mentioned earlier on in this discussion, having a dedicated test bench available is a very important point when you develop a drilling techniques. And we do have one uh, from the Paris School of Mines right next door, which enabled us to do a lot of oral testing and then move into field tests. And uh, right now we've performed quite a number of field tests. In fact, uh, I mean, we, we just finished today one test on uh, on a real drilling rig, so drilling with the hammer in eight and a half as we would in a, in a geothermal project. And the goal, as uh, as you may know, th this is uh, the future of drilling, but this is the really near future of drilling. The technology is uh, almost ready. Um, we have tested it repeatedly in the bench, we're testing it in the field and we're ready to go commercial. Uh, we even started bidding actually on uh, on a project in Germany uh, run by Ever in uh, Gerritsried. So I'm very excited to talk about you today for the future of drilling and the new ways of, uh, of making hole. OK, thank you very much there, Rafael. OK, we'll go through a set of uh, questions here before we open up to audience questions later on. For those in the audience, Please uh, start entering your questions if you're not already. I'm sure you're already going full at it. We'll try and answer as many as we can today, uh, but it'll no doubt there'll be many outstanding. For those that we cannot answer today, we'll try and get the questions to the panelists and see which ones can be answered, and they will then be posted later on our website. So do ask all the questions you have. First, Paul, uh, hopefully you've got sorted your headset because the first question is coming to you. So, one measure stick we have for drilling efficiency is the mechanical specific energy or the MSE. And probably when you start laser drilling, the mechanical is going to fall off. So we're just going to talk about specific energy that how much energy does it take to take a cubic inch or a cubic centimeter for us on this side of the pond uh, out of the rock. In fact, when I think of laser, evaporating rock takes an extremely high amount of energy. So how much energy does it take and how do you get all that energy down this hole? Yeah. Hopefully you can the you can hear me okay. Um, so great question. And um, prior, there's been a lot of prior work to our company measuring laser energy irradiation on different various lithologies of rocks. So there's some very detailed SPE papers that I will reference the audience to. But essentially, it takes several kilowatts to remove. Uh, certain volume of rock and if you look at the traditional specific energy they do look at how much per lithology and compare it to ROPs of conventional measurements and I think that that was a good starting point for our company that demonstrated that the power levels are there with light to remove it in fact we don't evaporate the rock or melt the rock we use thermal spallation because as you mentioned we require a lot more energy and be an efficient process so we start with uh multi kilowatts on surface, which has about a 50% efficiency from electrical wall socket. We transmit over a fiber optic cable, and then we heat up the rock to remove the compressive strength by thermal spallation, and then we scrape it away and keep the process in. Okay, thank you, Paul. Um, similar, uh, Mark, you using a completely different and inapproachable, uh, what the drawer, if I you know, stand on a conventional rig there, uh, does that as well. Compatibility with existing rigs and system is always a major issue. Um, your system brings these projectiles down the holes and needs to be shooting at when I look at your visit at your website. You get thousands of these projectiles through a BHA. It doesn't look very compatible with an existing drilling rig and practices that we're used to. So how are you going to get operators, rig contractors and drilling crews on board? Oh, that's a, a really good point, Rob. Uh, so, what I'm holding in my hand is a small, what looks like a, uh, a paintball. And what we do is we pump uh, small projectiles all the way to the bottom of the hole continuously. And so, uh, think of it as another additive into your drilling mud. Um, everything's done, all the energy is applied down at the bottom of the hole, um, including uh, your fuel and your oxidizer. So you're using really simple, uh, simple chemistry, uh, air, 
uh, natural gas, air, and diesel. So the rig operators are already used to using these types of fluids. What we do is we combine them down the hole and create uh, this immense opportunity for rock breaking. The compatibility is simply putting a, uh, the ability to meter out the small uh, spherical projectiles down to the bottom of the hole where the system takes care of the rest of it in the bottom hole assembly. So uh, the complexity is a bit of rocket science, but it, uh, it's all at the bottom of the hole. The rest of the operations are relatively uh, conventional. So either you can deploy it as a conventional pipe or you can do a coiled tube solution. Um, conventional pipe is obviously more um, you know, typically used, uh, but uh, we think the opportunity to do coiled tube uh, is really amazing and could be a game changer for adoption to the industry. Okay, thank you. And then Igor, uh, this comes also, just the same question, and it comes from the audience actually already. It's saying the plasma tool is said to be completely compatible with existing drilling rig equipment. Can you elaborate on that a little bit already? And again, how do you get these vast amounts of power down the down the hole that you need? Yeah, thank you. So uh, for the plasma drilling, uh, how we are working. Uh, firstly, we are also considering evaporation as melting, as you mentioned. But these are uh, the processes that are extremely uh, intensive for the energy. And we are using uh, currently the pulsed thermal spallation effect. It means that uh, we are uh, working in a very short, our target is to work in a very short uh, uh, intervals and to be able to destroy the rock uh, in an efficient way, uh, let's say regardless of the depth uh, or the pressure that uh, we, we are working in. And uh, uh, regarding the infrastructure that uh, what we need for that, uh, the similar we are uh, focused firstly on the cold tubes. Uh, it means that our strategy uh, combining the conventional and the plasma drilling is uh, one of the cornerstones as we want to utilize as much as possible that is on the uh, in the existing industry market. And uh, cold tube has a super advantages like uh, we can be fast. Our target lifetime of the tool continuous work uh, is set to several hundreds of hours. So without uh, need of the tripping from the need of the maintenance of the tool. And uh, also now we are working on the uh, solution that can uh, fully use the rigs uh, uh, from conventional or uh, what we see as a target, at least for the first years of, uh, of the projects is the hybrid solution when we can drill through the soft uh, sediments at the top uh, with the conventional and then being able to apply the plasma when we will, we will, once we will hit the the down uh, hard rock and of course uh, what is uh, here interesting that our focus is for the hard rocks is that the harder rock is then the faster and better results we have so that's some anomaly to the uh, to the classical mechanical drilling that uh, for us then to drill deeper and deeper uh, is uh, considering the rock um, strength is uh, better so this is one of the parameters we achieved we also already proved Okay, thank you. Uh, Bill, would you want to add to this for your equally unconventional system? How how do you you know how do you get the power down? How compatible is it? And how do we get things like cuttings out of the hole? Do you create cuttings? Uh, you might want to unmute yourself. Our process uh, creates miniature lightning bolts inside the rock 200 times a second. So we're failing the rock in tension. We use conventional drilling rig to sweep the, to manage the bottom hole assembly and to um, sweep the cuttings out. So from an operator's standpoint, it looks pretty similar, except it's drilling really fast. Um, the, um, we generate power down hole and, and so we'll get the power we need to do it. Uh, our efficiencies are, uh, we've looked at the specific uh, mechanical energy efficiency and we're slightly better than a rotary bit uh, or a PDC bit. All right, I'm staying with you there, Bill. Uh, on something completely different, developing a new technology is strewn with uncertainty and unknowns, sometimes described by a good friend of mine as a drunkard's walk. 
Do you follow a structured development and validation approach to technology maturation? For example, at this side of the pond, we have a DMV technology qualification standard. Is there something like that in the US? Do you follow it? Yeah, there are no textbooks on the technology that we're doing. Um, in fact, I've been told by one of my board members that I need to write one. Uh, and so when we started this, we didn't know how it worked. We had seen some things in the laboratory that pointed us to the process. So the first thing we had to do was to try to figure out what the process was and how did it work, study the physics of it. And then our next step was to uh, continue refine that, to refine the model and get to the point that we could then do, do laboratory tests and then full size, full rate, high pressure tests showing is taking it step by step to the point that we uh, could demonstrate the technology. What was key is working with operating company and uh, service company to be sure that everything we were doing was well focused on the uh, end product because at the end of the day the only thing that matters is what a customer can use. Uh, I even went to drilling school. I may be the only pulse power engineer in the world certified to run a drilling rig. And, and uh, that was very helpful to know what the real issues were and to stay focused on the end game. OK, thank you very much, Bill. Uh, Jan Jette, you've only recently started Canopus, but you build on the decades of uh, drilling R&D experience with Shell, as you said yourself. How does that approach your approach to, uh, how does that affect your approach to technology development? Yeah, thanks uh, Rob. That, that indeed must have uh, a major impact on, on the way I, I approach these type of uh, developments and things. I had a great opportunity to work uh, in the labs where, where expandables, uh, managed pressure drilling and, and spellable crackers, etc. Were, were invented. Uh, and all these developments uh, made use of uh, great facilities. Uh, that Shell had for internal project um, and I was thrilled uh, to hear uh, that uh, Shell uh, gave away these facilities to the research institute in the Netherlands uh, TNO uh, for public use. Uh, so th that's what they are. They reopened the labs uh, last uh, last February uh, just just before the, the crisis, the corona crisis. Um, and in, in that context I would like to, th uh, to, to mention three things. Um, before going for any challenging field pilots, etc., you have to de-risk and, and demonstrate to the stakeholders in a controlled environment like these facilities, and there are other facilities in the world as well, uh, of course, uh, but show, show it and de-risk it as much as possible. And that includes also the, the, uh, uh, the measurement of the specific energy that has been, uh, has been mentioned before, uh, one of the key parameters. Uh, but also the whole cleaning and, and all the other stuff. And that brings me to the second point, always aim for an integrated field solution. Not the most complex one, so not the most challenging one, but the least viable product as it is being called as well. Uh, go for a simple one, but a complete one. So when you go to the, to the field with a bit, make sure that indeed you get the energy there, that you avoid any potential damage to the well that is being given to you uh, to play with it. Uh, and make sure that you have your well control story ready, etc. Last but not least, make sure that you have directional control. Without directional control, there is a very limited application of most home making technologies. And the third one is be selective on the uh, field trial opportunities. So a badly chosen opportunity uh, with a lot of tripping time, for instance, if you go to a large depth, etc., will uh, the, the cost will uh, go uh, uh, sky high, uh, and you learn only a limited amount uh, of that, uh, and also a bad prepared uh, field trial uh, with the crew that is going to help you out with doing the, the test uh, can, can kill a, a, a technology already in its infancy, not because of technical reasons, but because of operational reasons. But one, one funny story about this, we once uh, went to a rig with the software rotary uh, system, which is mitigating the, uh, the drill string stick slip vibrations. Uh, and very quickly the, uh, the driller switched it off because the rotary uh, became completely silent uh, or at least had the monotonous whatever uh, uh, sound, uh, which is an indication that all the torque spikes were, were uh, um, filtered out. 
which is the function of the technology, but the driller got nervous because this was not the normal sound of the system and therefore he switched it off. Now that kind of things you have to prepare and it is completely unexpected what you can, uh, it can run into after uh, having spent so much time in the laboratory. Okay, uh, actually, Jan Jette, just staying, staying with you there for a second, I'm going to be asking all of you this as I come back to you, is how much energy does it take to remove the rock compared to rotary drilling with your method? Uh, and then uh, what, what systems do you compare? Yours against rotary, conventional rotary. Pick, uh, pick your variety. Yeah, no, so if, if I mean, in, in most works, of course, uh, the PDC uh, bits are, are the most efficient. Uh, uh, it is not too extreme in hardness. Uh, we uh, compared the rate of penetration and the drilling efficiency, the specific energy, etc., with, uh, with, uh, uh, with the PDC and tricone uh, bits. Um, and we found uh, pretty consistently that in every uh, rock, uh, after having selected the, the best bit, uh, mechanical bit uh, solution that you could apply, that abrasive jetting is at least as fast. And if you optimize the energy to the bit, uh, it is twice as, as fast as, uh, as conventional mechanical resin, uh, drilling. The specific energy is a little bit less. Uh, that's about, uh, 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 say, 40% less, but the amount of energy that you can transport uh, via hydraulics to the, to the whole bottom is higher than for mechanical energy because of uh, pressure restrictions in mud motors and other uh, downhill equipment. Okay, so, thank you very much. Yeah, okay. Okay, uh, Mark, same question for you, uh, where uh, Jan Jette comes from a very long oil and gas uh, pedigree. You were a complete new entrance to the oil industry. I remember when we first met, we did a drilling 101 uh, day. Uh, what benefits and disadvantages has that given you as a complete fresh pair of eyes to this challenge? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. So um, I'm, I'm a unique hybrid. Uh, as I said, when I, I first did my introduction, uh, my background, I'm an aero astro engineer with a master's degree from Stanford and uh, leading crew capsule development and uh, spacecraft systems between Boeing and, and Jeff Bezos' company. And then my whole family's, uh, I grew up in a mining town in northern Idaho, so uh, going underground is sort of in my blood. Uh, I left uh, conventional aerospace with this concept of finding a new way to fly. And I was two miles underground drilling with uh, a crew, uh, effectively uh you know the deepest holes core diamond drill core holes in north america and that's actually when i came up with this idea that you could take two miles of drill rod and do something special with what is uh, amounted to a chemical railgun and ultimately that's what hyper sciences developed from was an idea of merging an aerospace application with knowledge about that and you're right uh, to start with I, I other than managing drilling I didn't really understand all the mechanisms and quite frankly um, we went and proposed this to Shell saying we don't need to rotate at all um, and in fact we proved that that we could get um, incredible rates of penetration by pulverization of both the projectile and the rock so it has been, you call it a, a, a drunkard's walk uh, to develop these technologies. I think it's really important to understand you do have a path for us. It's betting on hypersonic velocity to do these really important things. And the fundamentals were actually developed in the 60s and 70s. It's just a matter of taking a technology like hypersonic ram accelerator that we use. It's a it's a special uh, technology, like a, it's a jet engine in a tube. Applying that to industrial makes us incredibly valuable as a technology because in aerospace, you'll fly once, twice a day. Uh, if best, 300 rockets will take off a year. Today, there'll be 30,000 airplanes that take off and land because they depend on jet engine technology. We're only going to be successful as a company as we're flying thousands of these every single day in a drill hole. And that totally changes the paradigm for both industrial use of this as well as our aerospace use. Okay, Mark, straight in one question from the audience there for you. Yeah. Uh, 
This stuff sounds uh, pretty dangerous and stuff. Have, has, have you guys considered safety and well integrity risks? What are the risks of explosions, shocks, etc.? Sure. No, absolutely. We've uh, actually spent years working with what I consider one of the safest companies in the world, Shell. Um, uh, you, know, you, you start every meeting with the safety moment and you start with safety briefings. Um, we've actually gone through and vetted and it's, it's great to have is Shell and another major company. In fact, we're, we're bringing on a, a few others into our, our uh, field trials that are ongoing right now. But it's absolutely critical that you take safety first. Um, we are doing something uh, where we put all the energy down the hole and it's a focused energy device, if you will. Uh, the, it, it, you're not, it's not an explosion, it's not frac uh, fracking. You're actually firing a projectile. Um, think of it as a, uh, an accelerator that's 10 or 20 feet from the face of the rock and it brings that energy right to the edge of the rock and breaks that rock. So um, up on the drilling rig floor, uh, you're not sending any uh, materials down there that are inherently dangerous. They're independent until they're used at the point of use. So your diesel is actually down below or your natural gas, your air is pumped down. Your projectiles have no explosives on them. They are plastic and concrete. So they're low cost, but they're also inert. Okay, thank you. Igor, you wanted to make a comment to that? Yeah, I think it's a very good point of, of making the difference between something that is in the laboratory and uh, to go to the real practice and the field is the health safety environment. And uh, I can say we spent last two, three years uh, with this topic quite a lot because uh, originally that's the difference in this uh, technology readiness levels that uh, something what you can ideally run uh, in some test field or, la or lab test uh, that you can build and then to be in a practical uh, utilization regarding some uh, vapors that could be created and to handle that, uh, this is something very different. And uh, also for us, it was like some learning curve that uh, we have to go through um, last years and to be able to set up our solution that will be compliant with all uh, healthy uh, health safety uh, environment issues. Also regarding the team in the company, we have to build a specific uh, the team uh, in a company responsible for the all steps uh, within the testing and uh, development and mostly going to the field. So um, I think it's one of the cornerstones of successful uh, commercial commercialization of the of the any new system that uh, wants to do the things differently. And of course, last point may be that uh, we should uh, expect uh, like all of us here uh, averse from the existing industry that it's something new and different. So we have to double prove that uh, our solution is safe and uh, uh, not bringing some big risks into the field. Okay, Rafael, the next one is for you. Percussion drilling itself has been around for literally millennia, but it was overtaken by rotary drilling about a century ago. Air hammers have proven their efficiency in dry hole operations, and we're now seeing some clean fluid hammers with promising early results in some deep wells. And there's also fluid mechanical hammers in various forms like the one by NOV. So there's clearly renewed interest in high interest from hammer drilling. Hammers are very compatible with existing drilling systems. They go on the bottom of them. They are used already in the field. However, hammer driven by a solids laden mud, as you guys uh, have, seems to have evaded the industry for decades with very much concern about erosion and dynamics. Why haven't hammers taken off and become mainstream already? Yeah, exactly. I mean, I, I completely agree with you. You might have, you might call percussion drilling, I mean, the past of drilling rather than the future of drilling. Well, in fact, the technology has been around for years and uh, you can trace it, of course, down to air hammers, which are today used in a variety of, uh, of applications to water hammers, which have been around uh, since 1985, 1990. But uh, the big step is really to take these, which are hammers used in mining, in shallow drilling, and uh, putting them in, uh, in a downhole environment, deep downhole environment. You mentioned one of the, the key aspects, which is erosion, because now instead of circulating very pure water or circulating air, 
you're circulating a mud which is uh, weighted, which has a lot of particles, which is not filtered correctly. So this was this was the first challenge in designing the mud hammer. And this challenge we overcame, I mean, quite early in the development. It's not something that's uh, that's been the focus in the last, let's say, five years. On the other end, another aspect is very is, is clear is that you need more fluids. So you need a hammer which is able to pass through a lot of the fluids. So this has been uh, part of the research. And the third point is to design a bit because you're not dis you're not drilling with the same bit on surface and 5,000 meters deep. So if you want to have the same gain and to multiply the ROP, I mean, we're not talking about 30, 40 percent gain like you have today with uh, with some of the hammers. When you're talking about high power hydraulic hammers, you're talking about multiplying the ROP by two, three, four, five. And that's what we've seen on the bench and in the first field trials. So it's a step change and uh, it required a whole new development and uh, it was a long road. But I think we, we are seeing the, the end. OK, thank you very much. Uh, I'll just stay with you, uh, Raphael, very quickly. And an audience question there is, how do these new drilling tools work with MWD and LWD instruments? And for the non-technical outs there, that's measurements while drilling for directional control and logging while drilling tools. Does that affect new tools at all? And then we'll go to one of the radical new ones. Yeah, I mean, you, you have two aspects, two questions here. The first is the impact on the electronics. Uh, obviously, your providing very high power impacts. So you, you're having, I mean, uh, tremendous G's in actual shock. So electronics have done a lot of progress in the last years. And today we are able to measure, uh, to have tools near bits, so very near to the bits, right under what the hammer is hitting, surviving or, or G's surviving our impacts and bringing us high frequency data. And that's something we're doing on a, on a daily basis. So they do exist. I don't think today all the MWD and LWD are compatible. That's another question. But these technologies do exist and we've tested them. The second question is the directional uh, behavior. This is largely untested because, uh, to be frank, there's nothing in the literature that's, that's uh, about this. However, uh, the tests are fairly easy and it's something that's uh, that we have set aside I mean, a lot of time and that we are pro probably going to tackle around the end of the year. We're looking at a, at a, at a budget right now to, to do this on a horizontal drilling bench and evaluate the directional behavior of a, of a hammer by the end of the year. So it's a question we're tackling that hasn't been uh, sold on right now. OK, thank you. Uh, Paul, the this, this same question for you. Uh, yours is even more uh, you know, out there. How does laser drilling interact with things like MWD, LWD, directional control? Yeah, we, we integrate with conventional technology, whether it's uh, really wireline and our systems conveyed in coil tubing. And uh, we have, you know, fiber optic tools that are conveyed today in coil tubing. And we're no different from that. It's just we are transmitting a lot more power down that fiber optic cable and using it to remove material to drill. So we we even have tools today that are used for other applications where we've developed that type of sensors and telemetry and things of that nature. OK, and likewise, quickly, uh, Mark, you've got a, a similar radical difference. How do you interact with LWD and LWD in directional? Yeah, sure. Our Houston-based team actually um, has a, a company called Kinetic Upstream now. They uh, were some of the original uh, developers of rotary steerable and have a actually an annular um, a system, electronic and control uh, that they developed uh, in our patents as well as uh, we now have um, them coming on as partners to help us develop the steerable portion of our drill. So it's very important for us to have a something that allows transit of our projectiles uh, and our um, you know, uh, accelerator through the middle. Uh, if you do want to do conventional pipe, you'll need um, an annular uh, turbine. And we've worked through that design uh, if you're using coil tube, uh, as Raphael pointed out, uh, or Paul pointed out, it can get a little easier. Uh, but yeah, we have developed the tools uh, and the electronics that are available today, both temperature and shock resistance. We actually put lasers and electronic instruments 
inside our projectiles and they handle our start loads, which are way higher than any load um, that you see in any conventional system. So we're we're very confident with being able to run our electronics downhole uh, in temperature and shock environments and have done so in our testing. OK, thank you, Mark. Uh, the next one, I'll go to uh, Bill first for the answer and then we might go around the table. Uh, and this is a bit of a combination from various questions we see coming in at the audience side there is, you might be able to drill on bottom incredibly fast, or at least as you define incredibly fast, but if it's too expensive overall, the economics simply won't tally up. Also, there are well bore quality requirements. If the hole becomes unstable, it doesn't matter how good or fast you are, you're not gonna get anywhere, so all might be lost. So as always, drilling technology is not just about moving rock fast, but it's part of the much wider requirements. How do you ensure your system fulfills all these needs? And people are also very interested in how fast you can actually drill. Yeah, uh, we have have been quite concerned about well bore stability from the beginning and have been very pleased with our test results in very hard rock in the laboratory that the the texture of the of the well bore is quite good, well defined, uh, easy for casing. Um, and and uh, I can't talk about how fast we can actually drill. Our strategic partner asked me not to, uh, but it's uh, it's quick. It's really quick. Um, and so the managing the well has been an important issue for us for a decade, because at the end of the day, the product is not the drill. The product's the hole. And we have to develop a drill technology that our strategic partner can then manufacture and use to drill holes. So it's been a big issue for us from the beginning. OK, thank you, Bill. Um, the next one is, is a bit of a combination uh, there as well from a number of questions. And of course, with all you startups, probably there's lots of questions out there on how much your cost per foot, what is your overall ROP? A lot of proprietary questions really that probably you can't put out there uh, overall. Um, let me see there what we've got here. Uh, a question from the audience there says, oil and gas companies have spent big money to optimize drilling technologies and spending huge efforts on there. Some have abandoned projects in these very same areas after very large investments. Where will your future R&D funding come from for these new high risk, long runway technologies for geothermal projects? Who wants to take that one on board? Mark. I'll take it. Uh, <laughs> I think it's goes. great to have partners uh, to help validate. Uh, folks like Shell uh, and this other company have helped us uh, by being there. But uh, if you have a technology that you want to bring to the field, it's important to have a very, very clear focus to demonstrate one thing and one thing well, particularly if you're a startup like us. So going fast and breaking rock, very important. We've found that you can go out and fund these things um, independently um, with non-conventional financing, and you should expect to uh, to do something. Uh, you, we, we heard yesterday, I won't go all into it, but you know, you start out with the four Fs, your your friends, your family, <laughs> uh, and uh, you, I think what are the, anyway, there, there's, there's four of them, but it, it ends with, um, you know, you have to go out and seek enough capital to make these things work to get to the point of critical field proof. I don't think the big companies, I don't, you know, I don't know where, who, who wrote the question, but in general, uh, people would like to see the technology sitting on the back of a pickup truck and that's when they're ready to fund you. So get ready to actually get to that point. And that's what we're doing at Hyper Sciences is actually bringing it to the field and funding most of this through crowd financing. So, um, you know, Seed Invest and Start Engine are ways for us. We've raised over 10 million ourselves on crowd financing and are continuing to do that with Seed Invest. Okay, Igor, you wanted to make a comment, yeah. Respond to this? Yeah, uh, I see why also in general that why these innovations and, and these radical innovations in the drilling industry are not happening is that uh, there are a lot of uh, very big obstacles for new startups to create some ecosystem. You compare it with some other industries like, uh, I don't know, IT or, or solar and so on. You see uh, tons of companies that are trying to do something and uh, uh, something significant. And uh, here we see the a uh, big uh, obstacle is the financing uh, and, of course, uh, the time. 
So these are two connected things that to develop and uh, then maybe mainly the proof, the new drilling technology, it takes years. It is not a job for a few months. And uh, and also the expenses for building such kind of system and to have the test facility that you can prove it, it's, uh, it's a big obstacle. So also, uh, I agree with that, that uh, first of all, also we started with some friends from family and angel investors and our own money. But soon as we knew that uh, this is uh, really significantly above our uh, possibilities, we were able to combine uh, private and public sources, but also our expectation now in, uh, for example, for us in this space, and uh, we mostly we used uh, till now private uh, equity or the sources for the uh, new drilling development and also industrial support in the form of some sponsoring or project. Uh, now we are also quite big in expectations from these green recovery programs that uh, mostly here in Europe uh, we see as a big potential that uh, governments are trying to at least verbally to uh, to promise that next uh, two, three years will be used. And I think is a, a big opportunity for geothermal to, to use it to make this step change. But uh, also on the other hand that uh, it is quite a unique opportunity that uh, I think the train is running and uh, we should be able to commercialize these technologies in the next two, three years because uh, then the other, uh, not uh, geothermal technologies, but uh, the other combinations will have the momentum uh, in this process. Okay, thank you. Uh, Paul, you wanted to respond to this quickly? Yeah I, just briefly. Wanted, yeah, I just wanted to reinforce it. I think that's a huge challenge, particularly when you're talking about 10 kilometers and 300 C. And you look at the drilling efficiencies in oil and gas with how quickly it tells it takes to drill an unconventional well. So I think that you know it's going to require some unique set of funding, and the traditional sources for game-changing technologies are gravitating towards other industries. And I think if we want to see something for geothermal, it's going to require something unique, at least in the United States. I'm staying with you there, Paul. Uh, I know I've got this for a few. Uh, people want to know in the audience how far you have drilled, how much money and time you expect to finalize uh, to get ready for a field demonstration. And I understand some of you might be close there, some of you might be further away. So, Paul, will you be the first one to answer this? Yeah, so so the, the work we've done um, in terms of technology readiness level, we've spent a lot of time in the lab drilling your four foot blocks and uh, come up with ROPs in the order of magnitude that are three times faster and with weight bits and torques that are substantially lower, so less than a thousand foot weight on bit, less than 250 foot pounds of torque. So we've done the lab part of it. And then in the field part, we've conveyed, conveyed to depths up to about a kilometer or so. And we haven't combined the two yet with a proper program in place and sponsorship we would probably be out there in the field to some depths in the next uh, year or two. Okay, uh, Rafael, do you want to respond to this as well? I understand you've been looking for opportunities or something. Uh, you mean opportunities for testing or for uh, funding or what? Field work. Yeah, no, I mean, Funding and testing has been the, the, the backbone of the innovation and the ups and downs can be explained with the different partners we've had through throughout the history. I mean, the whole project started with uh, support from Shell and uh, Shell invested quite a bit in this technology in the in the early 2000s. Then Total took over the, the project. Again, that's that's all oil and gas DNA in the beginning, but the applications were so narrow that none of them came uh, came to to light. And uh, even though millions of euros were were invested in this technology, in the end we're seeing now the the light with uh, with geothermal, which also some operators investing deeply into it. And I think we're seeing the end of this and uh, with the geothermal operators now, keeping in mind. The most expensive thing is always the testing and uh, the rig rates and finding the right well and the right uh, opportunity to field test. That's what's been the, the pursuit for these uh, for these 10 years. OK, uh, Bill, for you, uh, the saying goes, hardware is hard. 
you've been at this technology for coming on 20 years, I think, since 2003, you mentioned. How is such a time frame sustainable in today's rapid return on investment expectations? That's a good question. Um, when we first uh, started uh, looking at the at the drilling industry application for this technology, I had a very helpful conversation with people at uh, Schlumberger, and they said it takes 20 years in the oil and gas industry to go from a new idea to a product in the field. And so we're about on track. Um, we, we first had a private investor that funded the work to the point we could demonstrate it. Then, a, then an operating company got involved in it once they saw what we were doing, and then a service company got involved in it. And it's the industrial funding has been the key. And uh, we've, we have a very solid patent portfolio that we own, which is also key to it. And so the, the uh, funding process has really been by the customers, by the people that need it. Uh, and they're the ones that have put the money into it and are continuing to do so. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mark, one for you, uh, audience question. Yeah. Do these techno do, does your technique transition to large boreholes and will there be stability issues? Okay, yeah, so great question. Um, we have developed a technology that um, offers you any variety of hole size. Uh, so for instance, uh, the project line, I know this one isn't spherical, this one I'm uh, using right now, that's capable of drilling up to a 12 and a half inch hole with most of it being done uh, with the hypersonic impact. Uh, what you're doing is you're actually shooting off center and you're allowing the drill bit, that very outer an you know, annular section to be drilled where you have the highest torque in your bit is most efficient. So that's how we maintain borehole control and what we call augmented hyper drilling. In the case where you're making even bigger hole, I mean, let's be honest, a geothermal hole is not just a drill hole. It's like a shaft and it's more like a mining shaft. And so what we're doing is using these type projectiles to tunnel bore and shaft bore much faster and larger area. Turns out you can very reasonably control the outer perimeter, even with your shot pattern, depending on the size. So borehole stability very important and you know while we can hypersonically have a, an order of magnitude increase in rop our real job is to have an order of magnitude decrease in overall cost of drilling and completing if you want to actually drive the cost you can't just solve it in drilling if drilling were free geothermal is still expensive so we work very hard to make sure that our systems are compatible with really low cost completions, which means, in fact, one of our patents is actually completing while you're drilling. So you're effectively building your completed hole while you're drilling, maintaining your stability all the way along. Yeah, the same uh, stability question for the Spalatian people. So either Bill or Igor who wants to, or maybe even Paul who wants to answer this, uh, there is talk about glassifications or modifications to like of the side of the well bore that would even give massive benefit to well bore stabilities. Who wants to take that question from you three? Igor, do you want to answer that? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well stability, uh, in our case, and we are using uh, plasma in a continuous or pulse mode. Uh, we are not vibrating. Uh, we are not changing uh, anything substantial in a well. That's important in contrast to melting or evaporation when you are also influencing the, the borehole walls. Uh, here regarding the potential, how to increase even the opposite, like utilize it for the for the well stability, is that uh, in specific regime we already had some uh, smaller sub project uh, with uh, one of the uh, drilling service companies uh, to be able to prove that we can uh, seal or partially increase the stability of the of the walls. And it looks that it's a viable process because it will be something like called uh, a casing while or sealing or casing while drilling, and that will be the really another game changer connected with the drilling. And uh, for us uh, now, what is for at least for the first uh, tests and uh, and the field trials, 
uh, we are here strongly compatible with existing uh, solutions also to keep the well uh, stable. So as we are using the, all the equipment and, uh, and the infrastructure conventional, uh, it means that uh, at least uh, we want to uh, make in a first step the same level as it is today. OK, thank you. Uh, Jan Jette, for you. Uh, are these techniques compatible with multi-leg horizontals and are there life cycle issues like the equivalent of bit life? Um, yeah, so uh, um, uh, it, uh, of, of course, uh, so the essence, I think, of all the technologies that are being presented here is that the, uh, the, the, the hole making technology does not uh, require a rate on bit or torque on bit. And that means that the wear of the of the bit is uh, primarily determined by uh, the, the the duration of the operation, and not so much by the interaction of the uh, of the hole making method and and the uh, and the target uh, formation. Um, so, th and this is kind of uh, a bridge that that the, the holy grail I think of of hole making is finally getting uh, a technology does not that not requires on on weight on bit or torque on bit uh, in the end. So longevity, if you look at the abrasive jetting stuff, uh, the bit is touching the hole bottom, um, but you uh, adjust the weight on bit in such a way that it is minimal and that the longevity is, uh, uh, is as, as long as possible. Uh, other components, uh, of course, you have to, uh, uh, to monitor a few specific wear parts, etc. And uh, but that is all that can be tested and controlled and uh, there is no, uh, no, no, no issue there in, the, in that respect. And that will indeed also eliminate a number of uh, of disadvantages like uh, like uh, tripping uh, tripping time on on drilling rigs uh, and cost reduction in that respect. And I expect that that is something that might be be similar to to the other technologies that are being presented now as well. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next one we will see who wants to take this one. What is the driving time to get to market? Is it the speed of the technology development or is it scarcity of funding? Who wants to take this one, gentlemen? Rafael. Please unmute yourself. Yeah, sorry. Uh, been there, done that. Uh, I think uh, we would all agree, and uh, I'm ready to share views there. But uh, one of the the challenges in our in our industry is that it's not very easy to get testing opportunities and to get to demonstrate our technology in a real world environment. Uh, as I mentioned before, tests are extremely expensive. So unlike in electronics or in software or in other te technologies which are extremely cheap to demonstrate in a real world environment, uh, if we want to prove our tool works, we need to put it at the very bottom of a very expensive tool called a, a drilling rig and a drilling BHA on something that's already been uh, costing millions to drill all the way down to four or five thousand meters and then show that not only our tool is not damaging the very high investment that's been made by the operator, but making him gain enough money uh, so that it offsets the existing technology, which, which had the opportunity to uh, get refined and better for years and years on these, these same rigs. So th this is a high step and this is what I find the most difficult in our, in our industry. Okay, thank you. Uh, we only have a few minutes left. There's a lot of really good questions coming in from the audience, I see, which unfortunately we won't be able to get to. But let, let me wrap this up. These six technologies are all very different in how they remove rock, but are all subsystems in the overall distance in the overall drilling system where you all share a joint. Uh, let me go back to that. Your six technologies are all very different in how you remove rock. But are there subsystems in the overall drilling systems where all of you have a joint need? And I'm thinking of, you know, working in the ultra high temperature, ultra high pressure environment. Are there needs in non systems and etc. How reliant are you guys on developments in other areas? And what can the wider technical, economic and political environment do to improve progress for you? Who wants to take this one? Bill, and then Mark. 
The high temperature of the geothermal environment is a big issue for us, and we are actively working with NREL under an RPE contract to develop switches, capacitors needed for the geothermal environment. So the the high temperature electronics are a big deal for us. OK, thank you, Mark. Yeah, I think um, I agree that the temperature environment is a common one. I think with and I know this isn't about the completions, but without drilling uh, being compatible with low cost completions, you're just solving a small part of the bigger problem. And yes, geothermal traditionally today could be 30 to 50 percent of your cost could be drilling, but you completions combining the two is, I think, critical. OK, Jan Yete, you wanted to add to this and then Igor. Yeah, just uh, uh, on, on the uh, measurement while drilling or the, the surveying sensors that you need for uh, for the correct uh, well placement. Uh, when temperature increases, then the accuracy uh, and the precision goes down quite dramatically. Um, so, and for some of the of the or for many of the uh, geothermal player systems, you need with with multilaterals and whatever you need to place the well in the right place. So these high temperature reliable. Uh, surveying sensors uh, will will be uh, will be important. Yeah, I, I think Rob, the one thing I was bringing up when we fire wow. our projectiles, you actually get an acoustic signal where you can see downhole what's going on. So it's very important to to help your completions as well as your knowledge. Okay, Igor, you wanted to add something? I think one. I agree with colleagues, and uh, one absolutely big uh, non-technical problem that I think is for all of us is the communication. So here it doesn't matter if we are talking to investors or to the politicians or to the uh, to the funds that are available. The lack of knowledge of the geothermal potential and specifically to all of us, like we are opening something totally new. And I think what I hear listen is an ambition. And what I see the, now currently also in Europe, I'm not so familiar in the States, but uh, I see similarly is really the clearly articulated ambition of the industry to bring the disruptive solution that can bring totally new financial, economical and energy market for the companies like, for example, also oil and gas. We call it here internally like switch to clean. And this is, I think, one of the very important points that uh, is a challenge for next years. Jan Jette, you wanted to quickly add and respond to this? Uh, very briefly, please. Yeah, a very quick one. Uh, indeed, the the uh, the funding and and the uh, the opportunities to pilot uh, the tests, uh, the 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 technology is extremely important. There are many uh, subsidy schemes in at least in Europe that you can uh, can make use of or try. But these are lengthy processes and take at least a year. And it would be great if there is a much faster way to get these funds available if you have a good plan. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm afraid we have only a minute left, gentlemen, so I would like to thank you very much for your time. Time has flown by as usual. For all the questions and anybody in the audience out there that thinks you've got something to add to these people, something to contribute to them, all six of them are on LinkedIn, so please go and fill their boxes for them, offer them your services, and let them know how you can help them get their technology to market faster and cheaper. For all the other stuff that we didn't address today, for the hot wells that we need to be drilling in the near future to make these wells faster and an awful lot cheaper, tune back in tomorrow when Kay Jong will address the future of wells, advanced tools, techniques and methodology. That's the first session of tomorrow at 10 a.m. Central Time. But stay around now because in half an hour we have some real heavyweights on board. We will have moderated by Peter Tazakian we will have a surprise panel consisting of James Dupree, former COO, Global Subsurface, Global Projects and Exploration of BP. He's only formal because he resigned, of, goes and retires after he committed, admitted to this project. We have Michael Lieberreich, Chairman and CEO of Library Associates, heavyweight in the financing, and, and we have Carl Pope, no one less than the former chair of the Sierra Foundation, and currently principal of Insight Stray Technology. So stay around for more fireworks in Pivot 2020. Thank you everybody and see you next time. <laughs>